Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio and this week I am getting started on the actual structures for the Wild West Boomtown of Calico. And the first one right off the bat is the Butterfield Stage Depot from Knott's Berry Farm. My Butterfield Stage Depot model measures just 8 by 18 scale feet and it's based on a sketch by Paul von Kleiben for Knott's Berry Farm's Ghost Town. The real Butterfield stage line was established by John Butterfield in 1858 and it carried the Overland Mail contract via the Southern Desert Route from St. Louis, Missouri and Memphis, Tennessee through Indian Territory, across Texas and New Mexico and on to Los Angeles and San Francisco, a distance of nearly 2,800 miles. Now this structure build started like so many of them do with a simple mock-up and this one's really quick and dirty. Just some foam core walls and a paper for the awning here. Now a lot of people have asked how I figure out what the dimensions of a building are just looking at photographs. And the quick answer is I look at the doors. Uh, doors are usually known dimensions, usually around three feet wide by 80 inches tall. So if you know that, you can take that dimension and figure out the size of the rest of the building from it if you have a good photograph or a drawing that doesn't happen to have the uh, dimensions called out on it. Um, basically what we're doing here is an adobe structure. And if you're not familiar with what adobe is, if you've never seen a real adobe structure, let me break it down for you. Adobe is basically just straw mixed with mud formed into bricks and baked in the sun. That's all it is. And then they'll take the same kind of straw and mud mixture and use it as a, a mortar between the adobe bricks. Very inexpensive way to build and a very popular way to build here in the dry desert southwest where lumber was at a premium, not a lot of trees, but there's plenty of dirt and mud. I'm very fond of adobe structures. I've got quite a few of them on the layout and I model them in several different ways. You can, uh, you can carve them out of hydrocal plaster. You can cast walls and then carve the individual bricks out. Um, you could carve it out of uh, a polyurethane foam like balsa foam, which is usually my go-to for projects like this. But in this particular case, I've decided to try something different, something new. I decided to, uh, use my laser. We're doing a little laser assisted scratch building today and um, cut out the walls from some thick basswood. This is 3 16 inch basswood and um, the reason you want it that thick is well adobe bricks were often you know 12 to 18 inches thick. Adobe walls are very thick. Great insulation by the way. Now since my laser will only cut material up to about a quarter inch thick I've decided to uh, make a kind of a sandwich with the walls here. The outer walls are 3 16 inch basswood and the inner walls are 1 8 inch basswood. So we put those together and you get a wall that's about a scale 18 inches thick, which is about right for adobe structure like this. And so you see we've got the four exterior walls and the four interior walls. And I think what I'm going to do is put the exterior walls together first. I laser cut them so they fit together very much like a puzzle. The bricks interlock like that. So I'll just use some yellow carpenter's glue, start assembling these walls right now. All right, now that the glue is pretty much set up in the corners, I'm gonna start installing the interior walls. And I'm gonna do that just by painting yellow glue on the back. Try to get a nice even coat on here. Okay, now I should just slide this in here that and then we're going to clamp it in place with a whole bunch of clothespins. The remaining interior walls were glued in place in just the same way and the glue allowed to dry completely before moving on to the next step. Now some of you may wonder why I chose uh, basswood for this project instead of something I don't know like MDF. Um, the reason is because basswood is really easy to carve and in this next step I'm going to go and really uh, address the uniformity of all of these bricks. The laser is great for making things precise. 
but it almost makes them too precise. I want these to look like Adobe bricks, and so I'm going to have to go in and round the edges and uh, do a little bit of uh, hand carving on all of these joints and surfaces to make it look more like real brick, a real Adobe that is. Um, and basswood is great for that. In, in addition to being great for models, like our we model builders love to use it, uh, wood carvers love to use basswood because it's a soft, tight grain wood and uh, it's really good for carving. The first thing I want to do is take some coarse uh, 80 grit sandpaper and round off these corners. Okay, now I want to go and do the same thing along all of these bricks up on the top. Sometimes it's easier to do this with a, an emery board. You get into those tight places. Now looking at this kind of crenellated roof line right here, there's a good reason for that. Um, <laughs> it, it looks almost like a ruin and Paul von Cleven designed it this way because he knew that Adobe, if left out in the weather, it just melts. It's, you know, it's mud and grass, it's mud and straw. So if you leave it out in the, in the rain, it just, the whole structure starts to melt eventually, which is why there's usually a plaster on the outside of Adobe buildings, but not always. So the next thing I want to do is uh, start to add some, some detail to the actual bricks here. And I also want to create sort of an uneven surface where some of the bricks are more pronounced than others. So I've got this chisel blade in here, and I can just go in and, and peel away the surface of some of the bricks. Now, I used the chisel blade in a triangle-shaped mini file to do most of the carving rounding the edges for a more realistic adobe brick look. And that is pretty much the look we're going for, right there. With the carving complete, I lightly sanded the surface with some 400 grit sandpaper to remove any fuzz or loose shavings. For the first uh, base coat, basically a primer coat of paint, I'm going to use my old favorite uh, Rust-Oleum Camouflage Dark Brown Ultra Flat. Next, I installed the roof, gluing some scale 6x6 timbers to the interior walls for bracing, but leaving the bottom of the structure open for future access. I okay, decided to go ahead and start adding some color to this. And this is the same exact paint I use on my scenery. And the reason I chose that is because, well, this is an adobe building and logically it's made out of the same stuff the scenery is made out of. So I'm just kind of scrubbing it on with this semi-stiff brush, I'm trying to leave the, uh, the definition and the shadows here from the darker base coat working my way from the darker color towards the lightest color. It's already starting to look like something, isn't it? I like to use a piece of corrugated cardboard like this to wipe most of the paint off the brush before I put it on the model. And I'm going to take the same color and I'm going to mix it with a little bit of unbleached titanium to create a lighter shade. Scrub that on. Slowly working our way towards the highlights and the final colors. Let me show you a little trick I like to do down around the base of the building. This is where water splashes up when it rains. It tends to desaturate and bleach out the bottom of the building down there. You want it to actually be lighter. I created laser cut parts for the windows, iron shutters, signboards, and the structure's only door from 25 hundredths of an inch thick laser board. The door itself was cut from 16th of an inch thick basswood, which I distressed with a razor saw blade before staining with my India ink and 70% alcohol mixture. Mm -hmm. 
Following Von Kleiben's design, I laser cut iron straps for the door with holes to accept some tiny nut bolt washer castings. I pre-built the three pairs of iron shutters, then painted all the parts meant to represent iron with a flat black enamel primer. Now while I wait for those pieces to dry, I'm going to go ahead and start prepping the window frames. The windows are real basic, just a two-piece assembly, an upper and lower part just like that, and those will fit right into these openings. So get those ready to paint and be on our way. To give the windows just a little color, I'm going to paint them with some red oxide primer. I think I can go ahead and finish assembling the door now and cement each of these straps in place like that. All right, I just finished drilling the holes all the way through the door. Um, so now I can add the nut bolt washer castings. Make it look like this iron strap is bolted on. Then I'm going to take a little uh, granite gray and dry brush very carefully over the tops of these nut bolt washer castings just to make them stand out, give a little definition, make it look like metal. This just fits right inside the door frame. Just like that. And if you're wondering what this hole in the door is for, well, my friends, that is a 19th century peephole one you can stick a rifle through. Now I'm just about ready to build and install the windows, but before I do, I want to dry brush once again, taking just a light, very light tan, and dry brushing around these window frames to give them a little age and definition. To glaze the windows, I'm just using some clear acetate I have a bunch of this in a box up there, and uh, <laughs> here's a pro tip. If you get, uh, you know, if you buy, especially things like electronics come in uh, plastic packaging, clear, uh, clear acrylic packaging like this, save the packaging. You know, I cut it into the squares and throw it in a box and keep it, especially if it's the, close to the right thickness that I need, and uh, never run out of window glazing. To apply window glazing, I like to use... Uh, Eileen's tacky glue, just a few drops around the outside edges of the frame on the inside, uh, rather than, um, say, cyanoacrylate. Cyanoacrylate will um, fog the uh, acetate in a very distinctive manner that looks like glue. So, <laughs> the nice thing about the uh, Eileen's is that it doesn't do that and of course it dries perfectly clear. Now one thing I want to do on these windows is simulate the look of old rippled bubbly glass like you see in old 19th century and 18th century buildings and uh, one of the best ways I have found to do that is with Woodland Scenics Realistic Water. I don't use it for water, <laughs> to model water necessarily, but I love using it for this. And all you do is brush it on the back, the soft brush, and what you want, you want the brush streaks to show, you know. So you brush it on kind of at an angle like that, and then very quickly dry with a hair dryer. The reason you use a hair dryer is because you don't want it to flatten out. Uh, this kind of stuff, it finds its own level and it'll flatten out. You want those ripples in there, so you want to dry it before it has a chance to do that. That is the look you're going for right there. Now I can go ahead and install all the windows on the structure. And finally, I can add the iron shutters. For the different signs on the model, I created these laser cut 
sign boards. Each one has its own little border that fits over the top here. And to go with those, these matching printouts. For the big sign on top, the one on the end of the building, and for the Butterfield Overland Mail schedule. And I actually went online and found a schedule um, with all of the stops, and these, these times are accurate, all except for Calico. I added that one in there. But everything else on here is accurate to the times. So what I'll do now is I'll cut these out. And uh, I think I'm just going to do the, uh, the chalkboard sign right now. Got this all cut out. Now I'm just going to use some diluted white glue on the sign board. Now, let's see if I can get this on here straight. border on. Not bad. Now I'll go back with some paint and uh, touch up this white edge that's visible around the outside. Knots structure has a had a tin awning that wrapped around three sides. Um, now on mine, this side is pretty much up against the backdrop, so I'm just going to replicate that look on two sides here, coming around like that. And I couldn't find any good pictures or drawings of what the supports for the awning looked like, so I kind of winged it. I, I designed my own and uh, laser cut the pieces out of some uh, 3200 seven inch thick laser board so that should make it uh, that should make it nice and sturdy and i'm going to put that together now and then i can uh, paint it up and attach it to the building and then apply the actual tin roofing material and i'll show you how i do that in a minute while i wait for the uh, primer to dry on those awning pieces I'm going to go ahead and figure out the lighting for this structure. There's one warm white LED and one yellow flickering LED uh, wired together inside. And so what I'm going to do now is uh, wire these two LEDs together in, uh, in parallel and then have feeder wires coming out through this hole in the back. That's what that hole's there for. And uh, then we'll test it out and see how the lights look. What I like to do, I like things not to move when I'm using a hot soldering iron. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm funny, I'm particular that way. So I have to just tape it down. Some 28 gauge black and some 28 gauge red. That way I can keep track of what's positive and what's negative because that's really important on LEDs. They won't work right if the positive and negative leads are switched. And I'm going to prepare here by cutting a sh couple of short pieces of heat shrink tubing. There. Okay. A couple more small pieces of tape. Now I uh, I like to use a uh, a no clean flux which just means you don't have to clean up afterwards. It does, it's non-corrosive. It's not gonna eat away your wiring over time. This bad boy get nice and hot. You can tell when the end just starts to smoke. Yellow. Right. Just slide up that heat shrink. A 
combine these two lamps together. See, and what that'll do is having those two lights together is it'll give a nice illumination with just a hint of a flickering lantern in there. You don't want too much. A little goes a long way. Now, I want the lights to be up at the ceiling in here. You can see that. Uh, but I don't want to glue it in place. I would like it to be removable in case I have to change the bulbs at any point. Unlikely, but you know, you got to plan for these things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a piece of black foam core along the back wall here. And that'll do two things. One, it'll uh, keep that light up against the ceiling. And two, it will hide the wires inside the building. Just like that. And it's just a nice press fit. Don't need to glue it. And I've got a couple of graphics that I'm going to glue to the back wall here just so you can see something when you look in through the windows. Now one is a system map of the Overland Mail in the western United States from St. Louis to San Francisco. And the other one is a schedule. So it's a little diluted white glue. I think it is safe to attach the porch awning supports now. Got them uh, painted up. Just use some of that Krylon um, dark brown and then dry brushed them with some lighter shades of tan and gray using Eileen's tacky glue. Nice thing about the Adobe bricks is it makes it easy to line things up. On the knots version of this building, I believe the roof is a uh, um, corrugated iron or corrugated tin roofing. And um, I could do that, but I think what I want to do instead is something that gives it a little bit more of an early look, and that is standing seam tin roofing. Uh, that's where there are the panels where there's a seam comes up in between each one of the panels as it goes down. And I'm going to try it on here, and I'm going to use a crystal board to model it with. Um, now, you could use a styrene, of course, or any number of other things. And there's probably commercial products on the market from Plastrox and stuff that you could use, but I'm going to do mine out of Bristol board. All right, I've got my three pieces of Bristol board cut to shape, and uh, they're going to go just like that. And for the standing seams themselves, I'm going to use some HO scale 2x4s. I guess this would be a 1x2 in uh, O scale. But uh, you can just glue those right on those lines that I've marked there to create the standing seam look. And then I'll paint this. And when all is said and done, it's going to look just like a tin roof. We are in the home stretch of this structure now. Uh, I've got a coat of this is a brown oxide primer on my tin roof and if I wanted to model a brand new freshly painted tin roof this this would probably work just just the way it is um, but I want to do a little bit more I want to add a little age to it so what I'm going to do now I'm going to take some grays some gray tones here so I mix up kind of a medium dark gray from some uh, craft acrylics and then I'm just going to squirt a little bit of this uh, gunmetal metallic in there not too much I don't want it to be too shiny mix that all together and now I'm going to use 
some, uh, this is natural sponge, natural sea sponge. Put a little bit in sponge. And then I want to get most of it off. And then I'm just going to go around and blot it onto the roof. And I want to bury this so some have more than others. Some panels are more have more of the rust look and some have a little bit more of the cleaner metal look. Now I want to do the same thing again but this time with a lighter gray. Again, we'll get most of that off of there. You don't want to streak it like that. You just want to make sure you blot it. Just directly, like one hit. Don't pull it. Now I'm going to use some black and gray chalks just to darken right along these seams here. Like that. Now it's time to add some rust. So I've got some kind of a terracotta color and to strengthen it, a little bit of orange. These chalks, mix those. And then I want to go kind of right down the middle of these panels. Some will have more than others. I'll strengthen that rust in a few places with some just some full-on orange, especially down here along the edge. I like the way that looks. So now I'm going to take some uh, some spray fixative. Uh, you can use like Tester's Dull Coat to try and uh, lock that in place. Sometimes that makes your weathering kind of fade away and disappear. So then you can just apply another coat another layer on top, as many as you think it needs to get the look you're looking for. And here's what that looks like after the fixative has been applied. Looks like metal, doesn't it? It's amazing. Now I'm going to glue that in place onto the uh, awning supports with some diluted yellow glue. Next, I built the remaining signs in the same way that I did the chalkboard, laminating the printed paper to the signboards with diluted white glue. I attached the sign borders, then painted the edges with a matching shade of dark brown acrylics. favorite part of any build where we get to add the, the final details and really bring this thing to life. I just finished building the signs so I'm going to go ahead and install those right now. Now one thing that uh, Von Kleiben's sketch clearly shows, and it's borne out in photos I've seen of the structure, is uh, cactus and uh, other weeds and things growing on the top of the roof. And that's not as wild and unusual as it might sound. The building is made out of dirt, you know. <laughs> the roof was dirt. They would put uh, basically lodge poles across and then cover that with compacted dirt the same stuff that the adobe bricks were made out of. So any seeds that got mixed up in there would end up growing up on top of the roof. So I'm going to have some cacti and weeds and other things up on top of the roof here. These are some nice uh, cactus castings from uh, Pegasus models made of uh, plastic. I've already painted them and now I'm going to glue them in strategic spots on top of the roof and then we'll cover the roof with uh, the same dirt and soil that I use uh, to landscape the layout. So that I also want to add some blinds to the interiors of the windows and for that I'm using one of my 
favorite go-to things. Uh, this is uh, manila file paper. Makes great blinds for old-time structures. And now I'm, I'm just uh, giving them a little bit more age and wear and grime with just a simple watercolor wash of uh, burnt sienna and cobalt blue mixed together. Just uh, dabbing that on there, make them look a little grimy and used. Maybe the maybe the station agent is a slob, I don't know. Anyway, get those all uh, painted up, wait for that to dry, and then I will glue them inside the windows. Now, interestingly, one thing that the Von Kleiman sketch does not show is any kind of uh, chimney or smoke jack, but it certainly stands to reason that a structure like this would have some kind of stove inside. Um, it does get cold at night in the desert, especially during the winter time. So um, I'm going to go ahead and add a smoke jack. I've, I've painted up, this is a, a casting, a white metal casting from Keith Wiseman. I've painted it uh, flat black and got a little rust on there with some chalks and drilled a little hole in the roof and I'm just going to put that right in there. Go. One thing I did just notice on the sketch is he shows a small bit of chain holding the door closed. So I'm going to add that. Just got a little bit of blackened chain here. Now I get to make a little mess and finish off the roof here by uh, adding some dirt to it. And this is a nice blonde shade of dirt. Should blend in nicely with the adobe color. Get to hide the base of these cast cactus plants. And we've got some dilute white glue. Let that dry a little bit, and then I can add the rest to the plants and weeds and things to the roof. I added more weeds to the roof with clumps of woodland scenics field grass, some flowers from Scenic Express, and some sage green ground foam, all held in place with Eileen's tacky glue. Okay, I think the rest of the detailing can be done over on the layout. One thing I almost completely forgot to mention is the floor. This is just a uh, laser cut piece of 1 16th inch thick MDF uh, and I put some 8x8s around the outside so it just fits up inside the structure. Nice uh, press fit and the hole is so I can stick my finger up in there and pull it out. That's it. All right, got the structure in place and I finished up the board sidewalk around it with some coffee stir sticks. In the days ahead, I'll probably add a few more details, maybe some luggage, an old trunk, maybe a figure. We'll see what happens. But for now, I think that's about going to do it. Well, there is one more thing. I've hooked up the wiring from the structure to the 12 volt uh, power bus down below. So let's see how it looks at night. Subtle but effective. I like it. I had an excellent time building the Butterfield Stage Station. I really enjoyed this build a lot, and I am looking forward to the uh, next structures for Calico Town, so stay tuned for that. But that's going to wrap it all up for this week. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you go out and try an adobe structure of your own. Until next time, keep moving forward, amigos, and adios for now.